Khrushchev's rise to power. The Khrushchev coup. After the death of Soviet leader Joseph Stalin, Nikita Khrushchev became the new head of the Soviet Union. He embarked on an extensive campaign of lies and attacks against Stalin's government, which was immediately cheered by the capitalist world. Many of these lies still persist to this day. Khrushchev's administration launched de-Stalinization, a flood of propaganda and censorship against Stalin and Stalin-era policies. In the place of those Stalin-era policies, the Khrushchevites implemented profit-oriented market reforms and other erroneous and anti-Marxist policies, which put Soviet socialism, as well as all the other countries and parties allied to the Soviet camp, on the wrong track. People often ask, why didn't anybody stop him? How did Khrushchev manage to not be voted out? How did he come to power? Khrushchev rose to power through an undemocratic military takeover, a coup d'etat, and used the military to kill, imprison, intimidate, and marginalize his enemies. But how did Khrushchev succeed in doing this, and why did he do it? These are some of the questions that will be dealt with in this video. Firstly, we should talk about Stalin's death, which in itself happened under very suspicious circumstances and has caused decades of speculation. The removal of Stalin's bodyguards. Shortly before Stalin's death, his personal security was drastically reduced. The head of his personal secretariat, Pask Rebyshev, and the head of his personal bodyguard, General Vlasic, were both removed under strange accusations of leaking documents and unreliability. This left Stalin vulnerable. Stalin's daughter, Svetlana Alilueva, said, quote, Shortly before my father died, even some of his intimates were disgraced. The perennial Vlasic was sent to prison in the winter of 1952, and my father's personal secretary, Poskribyshev, who had been with him for 20 years, was removed. Unquote. Peter Deryabin states in his book, quote, A commission was set up to investigate the entire state security apparatus, which then proceeded to cut Stalin's bodyguard to the bone. About 7,000 men were dropped, leaving Stalin guarded only by a small group of officers that had little security experience, especially as bodyguards. That completed the process of stripping Stalin of all personal security. This had been a studied and very ably handled business. The framing of Abakumov, the dismissal of Lasik, the discrediting of Pask Rebyshev, the emasculation of the Ohrana and its enforced subservience to the Khrushchevite-controlled MGB, Kazinkin's quote-unquote heart attack, the replacement of Shedemenko, and the removal of the general staff, from the last vestiges of Ohrana control, and certainly not to be forgotten at this juncture, was the MGB control of the Kremlin Medical Office. With state security and the armed forces under their command, the connivers were finally in the driver's seat." Unquote. Stalin dies. There are a number of circumstances connected with the death of Stalin, which make it in forensic terms a suspicious death. Firstly, Stalin appeared to be in excellent health immediately prior to the beginning of March, as was testified by an American journalist. Quote, and what of Stalin himself? In the pink of condition, in the best of spirits. That was the word of three foreigners who saw him in February. Bravo, the Argentine ambassador, Menon, the Indian, and Dr. Kitschlu, an Indian active in the peace movement. Unquote. Secondly, it is well known that on the night between the 1st and 2nd of March, there was a very long delay in obtaining medical help for Stalin. Quote, Khrushchev does not mention specific times, but his narrative makes it uncredible that the doctors arrived before 5 a.m. on March 2nd. This is many hours, perhaps 12 after the seizure. It is not true that he was under medical care soon after the seizure. Unquote. Quote, there is a mystery about what had happened to Stalin. His guards had become alarmed when he had not asked for his evening snack at 11 p.m. The security men picked him up and put him on a sofa, but doctors were not summoned until the morning. Stalin lay helpless and untreated for the better part of a day, making recuperative treatment much harder. Why did the party leaders prolong the delay? Some historians see evidence of premeditated murder. Unquote. Quote, Only on the next morning did the first physicians arrive. Unquote. Quote, physicians were finally brought in to the comatose leader after a 12 or 14 hour interval. Unquote. Thirdly, there was a deliberate lie in the announcement of his death, which was stated to have taken place in his Moscow apartment, whereas it actually occurred in his dacha at Kuntsevo. 
Historian Adam Ullam asserts that a, quote, conspiratorial air colored the circumstances of Stalin's death. The belated communique announcing his stroke was emphatic that it had occurred at his quarters in the Kremlin, yet it was to his country villa that his daughter Svetlana was summoned on March 2nd to be by his deathbed. He was stricken away from Moscow. The official communique lied about the place where Stalin had suffered the fatal stroke and died. There was an obvious reason behind the falsehood. His successors feared that a true statement about where he was at the time of the seizure would lead to rumors that the stroke had occurred while he was being kidnapped or incarcerated by the oligarchs. Crowds might surge on the Kremlin, demanding an accounting of what had been done to their father and protector. Unquote. Fourthly, the revisionist conspirators had an ample and urgent motive, that of self-preservation, for eliminating Stalin. Quote, for many leading Soviet statesmen and officials, Stalin's demise came in the nick of time. Whether or not it was due to natural causes is another matter. Unquote. Quote, While murder cannot be proved, there was no question that motive for murder existed. For if Stalin were dying a natural death, it was the luckiest thing that had ever happened to the men who stood closest to him. Unquote. What was this motive? We need to take a little detour to explore this question. Older theories have suggested that Stalin was attempting to purge the party and state of careerists and bureaucrats. However, newer research suggests a more systemic change. According to historian Alexander Pishikov, who is very much an anti-communist and an anti-Stalin historian, in 1947 there was a proposition to update the party's program. This 1947 party program has never been made available. According to Pishikov, this program described, quote, a progressive narrowing of the political functions of the state and the conversion of the state into, in the main, an organ of the management of the economic life of society, unquote. It was clearly a plan for transitioning from socialism to communism, as described by Marx and Engels. Pishikov explains that the draft, quote, concerned the development of the democratization of the Soviet order. This plan recognized as essential a universal process of drawing workers into the running of the state, into daily active state and social activity, on the basis of a steady development of the cultural level of the masses, and a maximal simplification of the functions of state management. It proposed in practice to proceed to the unification of productive work with participation in the management of state affairs, with the transition to the successive carrying out of the functions of the management by all working people. It also expatiated upon the idea of the introduction of direct legislative activity by the people, for which the following were considered essential. A. To implement universal voting and decision-making on the majority of the most important questions of governmental life, in both the social and economic spheres, as well as in questions of living conditions and cultural development. B. To widely develop legislative initiative from below, by means of granting to social organizations the right to submit to the Supreme Soviet proposals for new legislation c. To confirm the right of citizens and social organizations to directly submit proposals to the Supreme Soviet on the most important questions of international and internal policy. In short, this would have shifted power away from the mid-level managers and politicians directly to the workers, who had now become literate and educated enough to run all of society. According to Pishikov, Leningrad party chief Zdanov proposed convening the 19th Party Congress at the end of 1947 or 1948. He also set forth a plan for a simplified order of convocations of party conferences once a year, with quote-unquote compulsory renewal of not less than one-sixth of the membership of the Central Committee per year. If put in effect, and if renewal actually resulted in more turnover of CC members, this would have meant the first secretaries and other party leaders in the Central Committee would have been less entrenched in their positions, making room for new blood in the party's leading body, facilitating rank-and-file criticism of the party leaders with at least the possibility of replacement of no less than one-sixth of the Central Committee every year through a party conference. This plan envisaged the development of democracy from below in both the state and the party itself. We do not know exactly how this plan was rejected. Zdanov, who was a close ally of Stalin's, died seemingly of a heart attack the same year he made the proposition, which in hindsight is quite a coincidence. Zdanov's death would later be used in the so-called doctor's case or doctor's plot, where a number of doctors were accused of trying to murder Soviet politicians. There is no clear evidence about the truth regarding the doctor's plot. Some of the cases were clearly frauds orchestrated by Khrushchev, which he then blamed on his enemies, but it is possible some of the cases were genuine. 
Stalin was personally not convinced about the guilt of the doctors. He himself would of course die under very suspicious circumstances, seemingly after being deliberately denied adequate medical care. The 1947 draft plan was rejected. How, we do not know. Zhanov had proposed a party congress in 1948, which would have been according to the normal custom, but for an unknown reason, the 19th Party Congress was postponed until 1952. All of this suggests that which the liberal historian Arch Getty had argued, that the true power in the Soviet Union was in many ways not held by the central leadership around Stalin, and especially not by Stalin personally. This was merely a Cold War myth, a caricature partially facilitated by Stalin's fame and the hero worship around him. He seemed like a larger-than-life figure, but in reality, the mid-level management and the first secretaries in the party had substantial power, and Stalin was in the minority. This group, the first secretaries, technocrats, etc., were also the most susceptible to corruption, and Stalin and Zhanov's new program would have attacked precisely this privileged group, removed management of the state offices, ministries, factories, etc., from the party's hands, putting it into the hands of the non-party masses. From an ideological and practical standpoint, this seems a necessary course of action. What is the purpose of a vanguard party? To serve as the proletarian ideological guide and leader, a relatively small group of the most class-conscious industrial workers, not a gigantic party of managers, economists, and statesmen. Having a party member manage every factory, school, or office is simply not what the vanguard party is supposed to do. In 1929, Molotov had outlined the Stalin Politburo's plan to proletarianize the party so that, by 1930, at least 50% of the party were industrial workers. This goal was achieved. In 1930, the party had consisted of 65% manual workers, 20% peasants, and only 14% white-collar officials. The party was more proletarian in composition in 1930 than it was in Lenin's time. However, in the Khrushchev period, the number of industrial proletarians in the party had reduced to 30% while half of the party consisted of white-collar officials, the biggest group in the party. This makes it very clear why it was possible for Khrushchev to rally the bureaucrats around him and defeat all the egalitarian, democratic, and proletarianizing efforts. This also makes the Trotskyist accusation that Stalin was the leader of a bureaucratic caste ridiculous, as his efforts in 1930 created a party that was less bureaucratic and more proletarian than Lenin's. To explore how the bureaucratization in the party occurred during the 1940s and early 50s is beyond the scope of this video, but the popular explanations given are the material conditions of Russia where the state was forced to rely on a minority of experts as the masses were largely uneducated, as well as the massive death toll of the best communist cadres and proletarians in the Second World War, forcing the party and state to admit vast amounts of less suitable people within its ranks in the late 40s to replace the losses it is necessary to take into account the circumstantial evidence of the series of measures undertaken by the conspirators in the months prior to Stalin's death to destroy the system of defenses that had surrounded him. It is not surprising, therefore, within the weeks of Stalin's death, rumors should circulate that he had been murdered. Quote, there were rumors, above all in Georgia, that Stalin had been poisoned. Unquote. Stalin's son, Vasily, is reported to have cried out, quote, they are going to kill him, they are going to kill him, unquote. Quote, Stalin's son Vasily kept coming in and shouting, they've killed my father, the bastards, unquote. Vasily was arrested in April 1953 in order, as his sister Svetlana puts it, to isolate him. Quote, after my father's death, Vasily was arrested. This happened because he had threatened the government. He talked that my father was killed by his rivals, all things like that, and always many people around him, so they decided to isolate him. He stayed in jail until 1961, and soon he died. Unquote. Quote, Vasily was convinced that our father had been poisoned, or killed. Throughout the period before the funeral, he accused the government, the doctors, and everybody in sight of using the wrong treatment on my father. He was arrested on April 18, 1953. A military collegium sentenced him to eight years in jail. He died on March 19, 1962. Vasily was jailed for pointing out the obvious, that Stalin was denied proper medical care. Journalist George Bortoli stated, quote, 
Vasily Stalin had said aloud what the others were thinking to themselves. In less than a month, all sorts of rumors would begin to circulate in Moscow, and people would begin speaking of a crime. Some people said that several members of Stalin's entourage were threatened by the coming purge. Had they taken steps to forestall it? Many other leaders, known to have been firm supporters of Stalin, also died mysteriously almost immediately after. The Czechoslovakian Marxist-Leninist leader Clement Gottwald died shortly after visiting Moscow to attend Stalin's funeral. The Polish Marxist-Leninist leader Boleslav Bierut died shortly after Khrushchev's power grab and purge of the Polish Communist Party. The Albanian Marxist-Leninist leader Enver Hoxha explicitly accused the Khrushchevites of murdering Stalin, claiming that one of them, Anastas Mikoyan, outright admitted it. Quote, All this villainy soon emerged after the death, or to be more precise, after the murder of Stalin. I say after the murder of Stalin, because Mikoyan himself told me that they, together with Khrushchev and their associates, had decided to make an attempt on Stalin's life. Unquote. In his book, Economic Problems of Socialism in the USSR, Stalin argued against the types of market-oriented reforms that the revisionists would later carry out against his wishes after he had died. Stalin's book was brushed under the rug after his death. The same Anastas Mikoyan then described Stalin's views in the book as an incredibly leftist deviation, quote-unquote. Professor Grover Fur concludes, quote, there is a long-recognized mystery of why medical care was not summoned for the gravely ill Stalin until a day or more after it had been discovered that he had had a stroke. Whatever the details of this affair, Khrushchev was involved in it. Unquote. First attempt at a coup. Stalin died 9.50 p.m. on 5th of March. The Khrushchevites immediately used their control of the security forces to prepare for a coup. The American journalist Harrison Salisbury was an eyewitness of how Shortly before 6 a.m. next morning, quote, smooth and quiet convoys of trucks were slipping into the city. Sitting cross-legged on wooden benches in the green painted trucks were detachments of blue and red capped MVD troops, 22 to a truck, the special troops of the Ministry of Internal Affairs. The fleeting thought entered my mind that perhaps a coup d'état might be in the making. By 9 o'clock, the Internal Affairs troops were everywhere in the center of the city. In Upper Gorky Street, columns of tanks made their appearance. All the troops and all the trucks and all the tanks belonged to the special detachments of the MVD. Not a single detachment of regular army forces was to be seen. Later I discovered that the MVD had, in fact, isolated almost the whole city of Moscow. By 10 or 11 o'clock of the morning of March 6, 1953, no one could enter or leave the heart of Moscow except by leave of the MVD. MVD troops had taken over the city. Could any other troops enter the city? Not unless they had permission of the MVD, or were prepared to fight their way through, street by street, barricade by barricade. Unquote. Quote, Even before Stalin's body was cold, MGB troops not only set up controls and halted traffic, including pedestrians on every principal capital thoroughfare, but also ringed the Kremlin. Unquote. The Marxist Leninists succeeded for the moment in foiling the planned coup by mobilizing sufficient support to call for the following day, 7th of March, a joint emergency meeting of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, the Council of Ministers and the USSR Supreme Soviet. In these circumstances, the revisionist conspirators lost their nerve and judged it expedient to postpone their planned coup and refrain from opposing the election of Beria as the minister in charge of state security, an appointment which obviously had majority support in the leadership, but also went against the interest of the Khrushchevites. Khrushchev wrote in his memoirs, quote, Beria immediately proposed Malenkov for chairman of the Council of Ministers, Prime Minister. On the spot, Malenkov proposed that Beria be appointed first deputy. He also proposed the merger of the Ministries of State Security and Internal Affairs into a single Ministry of Internal Affairs, with Beria as minister. I was silent. Bulganin was silent too. I could see what the attitude of the others was. If Bulganin and I objected, we would have been accused of starting a fight in the party before the corpse was called. Unquote. The Military Coup in Moscow, 1953 Khrushchev's coup went into action when the military arrested Beria, then Vice President and Minister of Interior. In July 1953, Beria was accused of corruption. At the end of June 1953, the revisionist conspirators claimed that Beria was a nationalist agent of foreign imperialist powers and had been plotting against the party leadership. Later, however, Khrushchev surprisingly admitted 
that they had no evidence of Beria's supposed nationalism. Quote, I could easily believe that Beria had been an agent of the Musavatists, as Kaminsky had said, but Kaminsky's charges had never been verified. We had only our intuition to go on. Unquote. To finally carry out his coup, Khrushchev had to gain the support of the military. Khrushchev said, quote, The Presidium bodyguard was obedient to Beria, therefore we decided to enlist the help of the military. Unquote. Quote, In late June 1953, Beria was repressed, either by arrest and imprisonment, or by outright murder. Unquote. According to historian Yuri Zhukov, Khrushchev managed to win some of the party bureaucracy on his side by opposing Stalin's proposed democratic and egalitarian reforms. Malenkov was pushed out. Beria was killed. Stalin had proposed economic policies, which aimed at total abolition of the small commodity production that still existed, abolition of money trade, and replacing it with exchange of goods of equal labor value, abolition of differences between mental and physical labor, and other egalitarian policies, and policies which would have meant a radical transition closer to full communism. According to Zhukov, Stalin also advocated for contested elections and democratic reform. We also know that Stalin had proposed removing the party from the leadership of managing the state as a necessary transition into the next stage in socialist construction towards communism. It would make sense that some rightist bureaucrats would be very much opposed to this, and consider these methods too radical and too left. According to Yuri Zhukov, there was a decision to decrease the salaries of politicians, which was supported by Malenkov. Khrushchev managed to win some people over by reversing this policy and returning higher salaries to bureaucrats. Quote, it is my firm conviction that the true meaning of the 20th Congress lies precisely in the return of the party apparatus to power. It was the necessity to hide this fact that necessitated distracting attention from contemporary events and concentrating them on the past with the aid of the secret report, unquote, better known as the secret speech, where Khrushchev launched an ideological attack against Stalin. It was necessary for Khrushchev to attack Beria, who was at the same time head of the security forces and vice president of the USSR. After the death of Stalin, he was one of the most powerful men in the country. Malenkov was head of the Council of Ministers or Prime Minister, while Molotov, perhaps the third most powerful man in the country, was foreign affairs minister. It is unclear how exactly Khrushchev was able to get away with Beria's murder, but it seems to demonstrate a certain lack of unity between his rivals. Khrushchev himself claims he was able to convince or intimidate Molotov and Malenkov to stand idly by, but this has to be taken with a large grain of salt. Beria's removal was a conspiracy full of deception, fraud, and a palace coup. Quote, On the night of June 26, 1953, Red Army tanks of the Kantemirovskaya division rolled into Moscow and took up much the same positions as in March, and the tanks were supported by infantry from the Belarusian military district. Unquote. Beria's removal was made public the following month. A coup was also carried out within the Georgian party organization. Opponents of Khrushchev were labeled as Georgian nationalists, removed, and largely replaced with Zhukov's military men. In 1956, Khrushchev launched his attack on Stalin, the so-called secret speech. Virtually all of the contents of this infamous and extremely significant speech have proven to be falsifications. There is a book-length refutation and analysis of the fact claims in Khrushchev's speech, called Khrushchev Lied, which I recommend to anyone who is interested in this topic. But why did Khrushchev give this speech? As the Chinese communists theorized, Khrushchev wanted to pursue policies drastically different from the Marxist-Leninist line of Stalin and his supporters, and therefore it was necessary to attack Stalin's legitimacy. Historian Yuri Zhukov stressed that it was necessary for Khrushchev to combat Stalin's democratic reforms and egalitarian programs and restore power into the hands of the party bureaucracy headed by Khrushchev himself. The Chinese said something very similar saying that the Soviet party had become corrupt and revisionist. To me it is clear that Khrushchev also had to attack all of his opponents politically. Khrushchev did not only attack Stalin, he also attacked all his other opponents who were still alive, Molotov, Kaganovich, Malenkov, Beria, by labeling them as Stalinists. The evidence of Malenkov and Beria being loyal to Stalin is up for debate. Khrushchev himself turned out to be an extremely disloyal member of Stalin's administration we shouldn't automatically conclude that Malenkov and Beria were not suspicious characters, opportunists or revisionists, just because they were rivals of Khrushchev. We're simply taking Khrushchev's word for it. That is an entirely different question. But it was important for Khrushchev to label them as Stalinists, to marginalize them. 
стал, наверное, опыт, был вопрос такой. Такой рекомендант, он был вот 37-го года со Сталином работал. Он мне отвечает, не знает. По-моему, говорит, Берия у Сталина не был ни правой, ни левой рукой. Молотов. Why did Molotov and Kaganovich once again stand by without adequately defending themselves? It seems that only Khrushchev's people had access to the archival documents, which proved the secret speech to be full of lies. Molotov and Kaganovich must have known to a degree that Khrushchev was lying, something which they also mention in their memoirs, but they were relatively defenseless against the accusations. For all they knew, they might have been partially true, and they didn't have access to the archival documents and details. The same applies to the rest of the communist movement. Even Mao Zedong and Enver Hoxha did not publicly oppose the secret speech until four years later, when it had become clear to them what had happened and it was far too late. The next year, in June 1957, Malenkov, joined by the old Marxist-Leninists Kaganovich and Molotov, finally attempted to oust Khrushchev from power. They won the vote in the presidium 7-4. to four. However, Khrushchev argued that only the plenum of the Central Committee could remove him from office. An extraordinary session of the Central Committee was held, where Khrushchev was backed by military leader Gergi Zhukov, who gave a speech in Khrushchev's favor, even threatening to use the military to support him. Thus, the military coup continued, and party democracy was torpedoed by Khrushchev. Why did the general support Khrushchev, even though he later admitted that Stalin was a great leader, and Khrushchev was a dishonest and vainglorious opportunist? because Khrushchev had promoted Zhukov to defense minister, while Stalin had demoted him due to corruption charges. This network of scheming and corruption is what we generally know as the Khrushchev coup. The murder or possible criminal neglect of the dying Stalin, the assassination of many of Khrushchev's political enemies, the marginalization of countless others, the lies, bribery, and outright military takeover and total rejection of party democracy. Khrushchev did what he falsely accused Stalin and others of doing. As I was researching this video, more and more questions kept coming up, and the topic kept on expanding and expanding, and for that reason, I will have to make follow-up videos on the topic of how the bureaucratization happened in the Soviet Union, what is the Marxist-Leninist position on bureaucracy, what socialist democracy looks like, especially for us in the future going forward. Thank you very much for watching, please like the video and subscribe, in the description you will find a link to my script with all the sources, as well as links to my social media and my Patreon.